All right, hi everybody. So as I mentioned, I'm, my name is Christian Lang. I'm a third year PhD student from uh, this group. Um, I work on solid-state solid single photon emitters. Um, in particular, uh, my lab mate and I work on bulk organic molecules, um, which are emerging as kind of a, a new uh, state-of-the-art single photon emitters with you know comparable or competitive properties with epitaxially grown quantum dots or nitrogen vacancy centers. So when I was a, an undergraduate, I worked on carbon nanotubes, and carbon nanotubes were kind of discovered by accident um, in the 1900s as like a byproduct of different reactions. And what always surprised us when we were working with them is that you know the, the cascade of like research in their physical and chemical and quantum properties didn't come as a consequence of human engineering of a material, but something that was kind of already there, we just had to find it. So today I'd like to talk about a phenomenon that we kind of found, which has allowed us to take uh, lifetime limited organic molecules and optically entangle them with interaction strengths upwards of 30 times larger than the line widths of the transitions themselves. Um, and then the, uh, the consequence is that these states exhibit superradiant and subradiant emission. So to start with, I'd like to talk a little bit about superradiance and subradiance. What are they and uh, are they useful? So uh, in the field of quantum optics, the, uh, most of our time is spent engineering and characterizing light matter interactions, and the building block of quantum light matter interactions is a single photon source. A single photon source is something like a, a two-level system, like an atom or a quantum dot, where you can absorb a photon, and then at some point, it emits a photon. And ideally, every time it emits a photon, it's identical, an identical photon to any one other one that it might emit. And while all naturally occurring um, single photon emitters have you know, uh, different properties, none of them are perfectly ideal for applications. So for example, while you make it with an atom, while in principle, every time it decays, it'll emit an identical photon, the um, emission pattern of an atom is a dipole emission pattern, which does not perfectly overlap with guided light. So if you were to take an objective lens and you were to put a laser light through it and focus it down to an atom, you can expect at best maybe 10% overlap between the Gaussian light and the atom, so that if you sent a photon, maybe there's a 10% chance of it being absorbed, and then when the atom decays and emits light, roughly 10% of that is going into a guided mode. And the fact that it's coupled to the environment around it also means that um, if you were to store a quantum state on the atom and then leave it, it would decay over time, and so that hampers its ability to use as a, a quantum storage device. One way to modify a system's interaction with light is to take single photon emitters and combine them together. So if you take, if you had a two single photon emitters with oscillating dipoles, and the dipoles were correlated and anti-symmetric, then the total system would have a quadrupolar radiation pattern. Whereas if they were correlated and symmetric, it would be dipolar again. And uh, these two types of radiation patterns um, have different properties. Uh, in particular, if you combine these two and they're correlated and symmetric, the emitted power is twice as great, whereas the, um, the emitted power of the quadrupolar set is less. What this corresponds to in the quantum picture is a state which has a longer lifetime and a decreased coupling to the environment and one that has a shorter lifetime and a, is a brighter state and has greater coupling to the environment. And these are known as subradiance and superradiance, uh, respectively. So subradiance and superradiance states are um, applicable to any situation when you want to engineer the way, the way that quantum systems interact with light. So for example, um, in the realm of superradiance, if you have certain geometries of collectively interacting dipoles, uh, the superradiant emission can be highly directional. And so rather than just uh, making every direction, it will, you can make it so that it will preferentially decay into, say, a guiding mode, optimally. Um, there are also proposals to make a laser that is dominated not by cavity interactions, but by collective interactions between emitters, which could result in a a laser that was whose line width was limited not by the cavity but by the emitters themselves, leading to a millihertz line width laser, which would uh, be great for optical clocks. Um, in the domain of subradiance and applications of subradiance, the most um, uh, the mo most enticing of them, of course, is uh, quantum storage. Because a subradiant state has a longer lifetime, it's effectively um, insulated from its environment, and so if you could store quantum information on a subradiant state, it would live for longer. Um, and it's already been demonstrated that uh, you can store an excitation in a subradiant state, 
and then at will, by detuning the atoms from each other, you can uh, release that light. Um, another interesting application is quantum metasurfaces. So this is another really nice demonstration where a lattice of atoms, um, you know, atomically formed an atomically thin mirror. Um, and then another really interesting proposal is that if you had something like this, where a single atom in the center controlled whether the mirror was reflective or transmissive, then you could have a superposition on that atom, which would get mapped onto a photon, which passes through the array, which we use for quantum information. And then kind of a more exotic application is, um, it's been you know, theoretically proposed that if you had like three level systems that were coupled to each other, then you could uh, switch subradiant states to superradiant states. So one thing you could do with that is you could store um, states in, in the subradiant manifold, and then when you're ready, switch them all to superradiant, and then deterministically release an arbitrary photon state into a guiding mode. So another interesting thing about uh, collective systems is if you have two single photon emitters coupled together, it opens up a channel for double excitation of the system. All right, this is where the system absorbs two correlated photons and then releases two correlated photons. Um, and so this is a, just an entirely different type of uh, quantum light with its own applications. In particular, because the photon releases are correlated, that also means that the noise of the photons is correlated, um, which can result in um, uh, enhancing <coughs> sensing properties. So for example, it's known that if you have a, a, a maximally entangled state, you approach the Heisenberg limit of, um, of shot noise, where the phase shot noise approaches a 1 over n limit, where n is the number of photons, as opposed to the 1 over square root n that you would get if you had single photon emitters. And uh, it's already been demonstrated with um, spontaneous parametric down conversion uh, prepared n equals two noon states uh, that you can get um, enhanced imaging below the shock noise limit. And so if you could make a, like an ensemble or a collective system which released um, bunches of correlated photons, you could um, have uh, sensing applications for any situation in which uh, few photons are desirable to image something. Okay, so. You can get superradiance and subradiance whenever you have uh, two single photon emitters whose dipoles are correlated. And so the question is, how can you make it so that those dipoles are correlated? Now the correlation happens with a spin-spin interaction. So this is where um, two dipoles are essentially passing back and forth photons through the vacuum. The term is actually the real part of the electromagnetic Green function. And so the closer the dipoles are, the uh, higher the um, spin-spin interaction happens. And so when the, uh, the spacing of the two dipoles in, the, in this configuration is closer than about lambda over three, then the increase in the interaction strength is about one over R cubed. Um, and so if you want to make a system which is dominated by collective interactions, then it's desirable for this spin-spin interaction rate to be the fastest rate of the system. So in particular, if you have two emitters that have some detuning between them, then there's going to be a beep frequency. And what's desirable is that that spin-spin interaction rate is greater than the detuning. Um, in addition, if you have some decoherence with the environment, you would like that your uh, dephasing rate to be lower than the spin-spin interaction rate. Um, and what this essentially means is that you need the emitters to be uh, much closer than a wavelength scatter, so that you're in the regime where um, J is large. Now, of course, the other way to do this is just to increase the number of interacting emitters. So with atoms, uh, the difficulty with creating collective states in atoms is, of course, the, um, the diffraction limit. Because if you have uh, like a lattice of trapped atoms, then you can only get them so close that they're, that they're laser trapped. And so the uh, demonstrations of superradians and subradians seen so far are typically either with a cloud of atoms or with uh, like a lattice. Um, so if the difficulty with collective states in atoms is the spacing of the emitters, the difficulty in solid state systems um, where you can get things tens of nanometers apart is not the spacing but the detuning because in a solid state system every dipole is in a slightly different environment and so they all have different uh, transition frequencies. And so if we're interested in this regime where J is like the largest, largest frequency in the system and you can just have a few emitters which are strongly interacting, um, it's only really been demonstrated a few times in the past few years. So it was demonstrated um, last year by Peter Lodel, where he took quantum dots and put them in a nanophotonic waveguide. Um, and the idea behind this is if all the emitters are coupled to a single mode, then they can be far apart and still have a high spin-spin 
interaction, right? And so they were able to be spaced, you know, two microns apart. And because they were spaced so far apart and still interacting strongly, uh, the, the, it was possible to tune them into resonance using a magnetic field gradient. Um, a year before that, this was demonstrated by Brahim Lunis, uh, that, you, that he had uh, two organic molecules spaced tens of nanometers apart in an organic lattice, and placed that on top of a, uh, these nanofabricated electrodes, and using very strong electric fields uh, near the, um, uh, the uh, breakdown of silicon dioxide, um, he was able to use uh, DC star chips to tune the two molecules onto resonance and see super radiance and subradius. And then, of course, this was seen uh, this year by our group. Um, what's different with our system is that rather than using uh, nanofabrication or strong fields to tune the emitters onto resonance, uh, we found that simply by um, using you know, strong laser light to induce a charge transfer mechanism in the lattice, we're able to spontaneously lo decrease local inhomogeneous broadening within the lattice, with the consequence that molecules that were spaced tens of nanometers apart naturally tuned onto resonance, giving super radiant and sub radiant states. Um, and because this was a, a permanent change to the lattice, we were able to turn off the laser and the super radiant and sub radiant states would persist for many days. So you might notice that um, out of two out of the three examples where this kind of regime has been investigated were with organic molecules. And so you might ask the question, you know, why are organic molecules well suited to this type of system? So right now you, you have only two molecules. By super radiance, you, you are not talking about multiple molecules, you're talking about two molecules. Uh, two molecules, yeah. Super radiance and sub radiance states with two molecules. Thank you. That's right. Okay, so our single photon emitter <coughs> is called Dibenzoterylene, it, this big guy right here is made out of roughly 52, I think it's, I think it's 52 atoms, um, and then it's embedded in a lattice of anthracene, and the uh, entire structure is held together by Van der Waals forces, so it's kind of a loosely held together um, Van der Waals lattice, and the DBT exists like, kind of as a, as a defect. If you remove three anthracene molecules, the DBT fits nicely in there without disturbing the environment too much. Uh, DBT has electronic transitions, so that it can be roughly um, approximated as a two-state system. Um, so you can you know, excite it from the ground state electronic levels to excited state electronic level. And when it decays, there is some decay to vibrational modes, and then some decay directly to the ground state electronic system. Um, and partly because the molecule is long and rigid, uh, the overlap between the electronic states and the vibrational states is low, with the consequence that the decay directly to the ground state is, um, is uh, pretty high. It's roughly 50%. It's been quoted as high as 70%. Um, and this can be compared to something like a nitrogen vacancy center, where only 3% of the excited state light decays directly down to the ground state and releases a, an identical photon. Um, another interesting property is because uh, because the lattice is held together by Van der Waals forces and is roughly loose, um, if you cool down these crystals uh, below 3 Kelvin, you can freeze out all the photon phasing and get a lifetime limited line width. So this is a line width of 30 megahertz, which is you know, a few times larger than you might get from an atom, and is the uh, Fourier transform of the lifetime, which is about 4.5 nanoseconds. And then because these things are very bright, um, you know, they release uh, 250 million photons per second, and you have a very good control over the spacing of the molecule, or of the uh, density of the molecules in the lattice. They have demonstrated a very high single photon emission Purity with uh, impurities around 0.1%. And then the last interesting thing about organic molecules as single photon sources is that because they're comprised of um, just carbon rings, there are you know, many different combinations still to investigate. So these are four uh, lifetime limited single photon emitters that we know about. Um, these are two different types of lattices that you can embed them in, so there's some modularity there. And there's uh, still ongoing research looking for something like a triplet state, so that you could have quantum storage or um, what's, you know, what's also interesting is they're looking for like, electronic levels that are within the telecom region so that you could integrate these with like, silicon photonics. So to make one of these guys is pretty easy. We just take a you know, dissolved anthocene and some uh, solvent and dissolved dibenzoterium some solvent, <laughs> mix them together, put it in water and sonicate it, and the nanocrystals uh, just form spontaneously in the water. And then you can just put a drop of that on the substrate, let it dry, and cool it down. So the entire process can be done in an afternoon. And then you have 
uh, very high control over the density. So you know, these these uh, nanocrystals are, you know, a couple hundred nanometers wide to upwards of a micron, and you can put um, hundreds of molecules in there. So this is a spectrum of one nanocrystal. Each line represents a single molecule within there. And so this is another thing which makes uh, uh, organic molecules a really nice platform for optics, is that because you have hundreds of molecules in a 100 nanometer space, uh, you have the potential to have very strong dipole-dipole interactions in there. Uh, now, of course, the issue is still that you can see the resonances are spread out over two nanometers, and so the likelihood of any two resonances or two molecules being on resonant is very low naturally. So what would be desirable would be for there to be an easy tuning mechanism to tune the two molecules onto resonance. As it just so happens, organic emitters have a built-in tuning mechanism. So and this was uh, characterized by Bassanza and Toninelli in 2020, that if you take uh, nanocrystals of anthocene doped with dimesoterylene, and you put, uh, say, a milliwatt of laser light, roughly on the order of a milliwatt of laser light, um, the resonances of the dimesoterylene molecules naturally shift. And they can shift by very large amounts, upwards of like 100 gigahertz, which is a pretty good fraction of the entire inhomogeneous broadening. Um, the way this is thought to happen is that if you have a dimensionary molecule lattice and you put high enough power laser light on it, you can ionize it so that there is a free electron in the lattice and then the dimensionary scoops up a lower energy electron so that you have an electron hole pair and the electron hole pair will migrate until they get trapped resulting in a electric field gradient which star shifts the dbt. Um, what's really interesting is that however this happens it turns out to be quite stable and so we've been able to tune the single molecule 100 gigahertz and then leave it for a week without any signs of it coming back to its original frequency. So it, it appears to be a, a permanent change to the, the, the lattice environment. Um, and what's also interesting is that as you do this, it doesn't decrease the, um, yeah, your question? Can you tune it backward? No, not at all. We have not seen that. So it, it, it seems to be um, spontaneous, but the, some kind of, um, What What yeah. control where it seems to, do you know where it seems to? Uh, no, you don't have control. So they just somehow like go to the same place, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. No matter what kind of. Uh, I don't know. It has power or whatever. Do you have some control? Uh, so so far, the only the only knob is really the the, the tuning rate. It seems you only use pump a bunch of light, and everything just shifts towards longer wavelengths. <coughs> and then you turn off the light, and it's soft shifting. So that's you can kind of turn off when it starts shifting, and when it's soft shifting. So so what what is the Horizontal line that nearly doesn't change, and then the other line that changes. Oh, this guy? One um, it's either so this this particular example is taken from what looks like one nanocrystal, um, and so it is strange that there are some that seem really stable. Either it's like a crystal which is in a particularly stable environment, where there's not a lot of charge transfer happening around there, or it's in an entirely different nanocrystal like nearby, which doesn't see a lot of the laser light. Um, so it, it, it kind of, you know, we kind of think that the shifting rate is proportional to the amount of laser light in the environment of the, of the molecule. And it's kind of an open question, like how local it is. You know, is it, if it, it's like 10 nanometers, you know, if you can make a very high electric field gradient, then you could differentially shift nearby molecules, but that remains to be seen. Uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but what wavelength were they using to do this? Uh, of, of light? Yeah, yeah, of the light, yeah. Um, Usually it's 785 nanometers, um, although we've gone down like 760 nanometers and we see the same effect. We're not really sure that the range that difference over. What are each lines uh, in the graph? Yeah, okay, so each one of these is a single molecule at this wavelength, that's the resonant frequency. Um, and then this, this axis is just kind of a, a, you know, you probe, see where everything is, then you pump it with like a milliwatt of light for 10 seconds, and then probe, see where everything is again, and you just do it over and over and over, and then just see how everything shifts as you shine light on the crystal. I see, so they kind of shift to sort of un unpredictable places and you still select the, whichever two are resonant or how Yeah, okay, so, all right, we'll go on. So <laughs> the, the first thing which you would think when you see this is, can you tune things under resonance? And so the first thing that's detected is to take five separate nanocrystals, each with a molecule in there, and just shine the laser on this one, shine the laser on this one, et cetera, et cetera. And then and that was shown to be able to, this is a controlled enough process because you can just turn off the laser when it's at the frequency you want and it won't move at all, that they were able to shift five molecules under resonance in like a 50, like 50 micron area. Um, but what we discovered this past year 
is that if you just you know, uh, shine like, a large amount of light, so 10 milliwatts of light for like half an hour, and then you just look for signatures of collective interactions, you'll see them roughly 50% of the time. So this is uh, the, the easiest signature to see is called a two photon peak, and this is um, essentially the double excitation channel. So when you have two molecules of couple, there's a, a pathway to absorb two correlated photons and then excite. And then the way you can be sure this two photon peak is either by looking for the, um, the saturation, which is quadratic with power, or you can do an autocorrelation measurement and see photon bunching. Um, but either way, yeah, it seems to be like a, like a spontaneous thing where you just shine a bunch of laser light, everything moves around, and molecules that are close together in space spontaneously tune together in frequency until there's a collective interaction. Uh, so when you probe the resonant frequency, you probe using laser again, right? Yeah, lower power laser, so like, okay. uh, like 10 nanowatts maybe. I see. I see. And so you, that does not induce any shifts? Like uh, yeah, it's not, not any shifts. Okay. So you, you probe it with like yeah. 10 nanowatts, yeah. doesn't move any around, but you can see where everything is, and then like milliwatt, 10 milliwatts of light, and it's a, <laughs> and that, that's the piece of shit. But yeah, yeah, these are like very quite, like pretty stable if you're not putting a lot of light onto it. And what is the probing fine? Like, do you um, so these these would be like a uh, probing time, or, or like, like pumping it to shift everything around, or no, the pro actual probing. Uh, like how long does it take us to get started yeah. like this? Um, like ten seconds. You can scan from here to here. Uh, a few seconds, more. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of confused. So you initially started the ground state, and then you probe to either the super radiant or the sub radiant state. Is that what you're exactly doing? Uh, okay, so as you tune the laser yeah. across the transitions, first you see, well, it depends on the orientation. Um, let's see this guy. First you see the subordinate state, okay. and then you see the two photon peak, okay. and then you see the superordinate state. Okay, but so, you, you, yeah. and you said it's 50% of the time, what did you mean? Uh, so if you take, well, if you took 25 nanocrystals, and with each of them you pumped it with you know, high, like 10 milliwatts of light, 30 minutes, and then just looked at all of them for interactions, and in 10 out of 25 crystals, we saw uh, in, uh, collective interactions. So it's a, it's a success rate of like 50%. But how many molecules are in each crystal? Uh, like 300. Or, yeah, 300 uh, is like emitting molecules. <coughs> so I, I don't understand how you form the lights. I mean, you have all the molecules. It seems like they are arranged randomly. That's right. But then how, why is it a light? Uh, okay, So there's the, the lattice, the amps and lattice which holds everything, and that's just like a crystal, and then you dope it with uh, the single photon emitting molecule. Does that make sense? So there are like 10 million amphetamine molecules making this lattice, and there are 300 uh, photon emitters just like randomly placed throughout there. Is that? So, so when you say the 50%, uh, so each crystal has 300 molecules. Yeah, okay, so the 50% is, is not 50% of the molecules. So, so each yeah. of the spectrum you show, is it just a pair of, so two molecules? Uh, uh, yeah, a pair of molecules in each crystal. Okay, so, so you're saying out of the, so 50% of the crystals have one pair of molecules. That's right. That, that's right. Yeah. So is it like a density matrix state of impure state of 50% entangled and something? No, no, no. no? It's, it's, it's different. It's, it's, not, it's not an ensemble. There are 300 molecules, but only two of them are emitting and they're insulated from the rest of them. It's not like all three of them are interacting. Just two molecules out of 300. And then you can probe, the, probe them, you look at the super state of those two molecules, the sub state of those two molecules, etc. What is the condition that you're making it in time by the 50% of the time while others are not being in time? Um, in order for the two molecules to be entangled, they need to be tens of nanometers apart in space. And then within like a gigahertz, uh, to tune from each other. And when you've met those two conditions, which are very stringent conditions, then they will form a uh, super state and a sub state. Maybe one more. So, so the correlation is my uh, two photon uh, resonance? Uh, this guy? Yeah. Yep, that's right. So, okay. Okay. the question is uh, yeah. should the sub radiant be dark? How do you excite sub radiant? Uh, so, in the sub radiant peak is not completely dark if they're in tune. In the limit that the tuning goes to zero, then the subordinate peak goes dark, as you can see here. Um, so we just took a couple of these pairs of interacting molecules and put more light onto it to see, like, can you coerce them to be closer together in frequency? And kind of not surprisingly, 
Um, they all did move closer together in frequency. Not all of them came into resonance. Uh, so we, we, probed, we did this with four pairs of molecules. Two pairs of molecules kind of got like a gigahertz away and they got stuck. And they seemed to be content to be detuned from each other by like a gigahertz. Um, but the other two cases, when we just shine more laser light onto the crystal, the two molecules spontaneously tuned into resonance. And you can see here the, um, the extinction of the subradiant. So what happens there is, uh, like I said, the, the subradiant state is when the molecules are correlated and anti-symmetric. And you're exciting the sample with symmetric Gaussian light. And so when the molecules are resonant, the subradiant state is perfectly anti-symmetric, and it becomes dark, and completely decoupled from the, the drive. And then you can use the point at which it disappears to measure the interaction strength. A couple of interesting things about this. First of all, uh, it might be interesting to some of you that the subradiant state is higher in energy than the superradiant state. Um, this actually tells information about the orientation of the dipoles. If the dipoles are oriented like this, then the superradiant state would be higher. If the dipoles are oriented like this, then the superradiant state actually is lower in energy. So that you can kind of already see like information about the geometry of the system just from the spectrum. And then another uh, kind of interesting side note, this was uh, in the paper by Brahim Lunas. He showed that if you make anti-symmetric or yeah, anti-symmetrical light, like the donut beam, you can selectively excite the subradiant peak and then the superradiant peak goes dark. So and that's, that's kind of you know like the first first hints of like the you know one of the like the, the goals of the subradiant state is you make a subradiant state which has a longer lifetime, but you can still selectively interact with that one if you want to. Okay, <clears throat> and then as you tune together, we were able to measure the different properties of the states. Um, the uh, autocorrelation function. So this, if you are above saturation, the autocorrelation function gives information about the Rabi frequency of the transition. As you can see, the blue, this is the superradiant state, um, has an enhanced Rabi frequency, which means that the transition happens faster, where the subradiant one um, is the opposite. And then in the lifetime, you see the expected result that the superradiant state decays faster than the subradiant state. Um, might be interesting to note that the Enhancement of the Rabi frequency, or the, the G2 function, seems modified much more in the lifetime. And this is because the, the G2 function, you know, if you're above saturation, you're essentially measuring the Rabi frequency of that of this um, channel. But when you're decaying, you know, there's a, a fraction of the excitation which goes directly down to the ground state, and that experiences a collective enhancement. But the fraction of the excitation which goes down to like one of the vibrational levels of the emitter, um, because those dephase very quickly those don't actually experience enhancement. And so you can kind of use this, or use the combination of these, to back out this branching ratio down to the, uh, the collectively enhanced channel and the kind of non-collectively enhanced channel. So, so how much does the super and subradiant enhancement suppression is? Oh, the lifetime? So the, the, the natural decay time is 4.5 nanoseconds. Um, this, these are about a nanosecond different. And this is a, a tuning of, I think, a couple hundred megahertz. So this isn't this isn't when they're um, brought into resonance completely, but yeah, I, th I think like, the most we've seen um, is about a nanosecond difference. <clears throat> okay, and then just to uh, confirm the measurements we made, we uh, were able to take the Rabi frequency and the lifetime enhancement and like the branching ratio that we calculated and stick it all to a quantum Monte Carlo simulator. Um, and what we just simulated was uh, the excitation spectrum, so scanning the laser across here and collecting photons uh, for many different powers, and then compare the simulation with the measurement that we did, and uh, you, you, know, you, can, you can extract the widths and heights of all the peaks and plot them against each other just to see that uh, the theory works out, that the, um, the simulation well matches the data. Um, and then just kind of like as an interesting side note here, uh, roughly speaking, the widths of these resonances contain information about the coupling strength, Whereas the heights contain information about like the coupling strength and the that branching ratio directly to the ground state and then to the non-enhanced vibrational states, and so it's it's kind of a good measure or a good way to confirm um, all the system parameters which you extracted. So what, what's the order of magnitude of the Rabi frequency here? Um, so okay, so that depends on how high the uh, the, the laser light is. So if you're like on saturation, then that's 30 megahertz. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. For the simulation, what uh, did you use a similar dipole dipole interaction or, or did you change something? Did you use an atomistic model for the simulation? No, no, no. We, uh, we, 
Can you simulate it in a So we put in you know, three level system here, ground state, side state, vibrational state, you know, yeah, if you have the molecule. Um, and there's, you're only coupling this transition. This, this, these, the vibrational transitions don't couple. That's good. That, that's the simulation we did. Okay, and then, yeah, so the question is, uh, where do we go from here? So the first and most obvious thing is, can we get a um, more than two molecules interacting? Um, so this is some, kind of some preliminary data where we showed that if you have two molecules or three molecules that are initially spaced by over 25 gigahertz, um, just by shining laser light, it's possible to bring them into resonance. Uh, now this particular triplet of molecules um, did not exhibit any collective interactions, so they're probably too far apart in the crystal. Um, but it's a good, you know, it, it's, it's unlikely that that would happen if the frequencies and, of the molecules are completely uncorrelated. And so this is kind of a, a promising proof of principle. And um, we're hoping that as we increase the density of the crystals, um, and then maybe also work on the synthesis, make them uh, higher in purity, so that they're, um, you know, decrease the inhomogeneous broadening as much as possible, then in principle, you know, it, it should be possible to see three, four, maybe more. Uh, molecules interacting. Um, another direction we're taking is to uh, take the system and couple it to a nanophotonic cavity. So this is a nanophotonic cavity that we fabricated with a Q of about 7,000. Uh, and the idea here is that if all the molecules are coupled to the mode of the photonic cavity, then they interact with each other, um, then the, the interaction strength between them is enhanced. And so you know, the three molecules we brought in presence before if you were to couple those all to the cavity, then they would very likely have like a, a three molecule interaction. Um, and then it's just a question of you know how many molecules can you bring into resonance in a crystal and still couple it to a, a atomic cavity, and then what kind of states can you get from that? Um, another uh, another interesting thing is so a lot of the applications for superagents and subagents, you know, because they're kind of designed with atoms in mind. So a lot of uh, the applications are kind of designed for lattices of interacting molecules. And so one thing that we are uh, investigating is there's a, a method called co-celebration, where instead of making the nanocrystals in solution, you can take a, a vacuum chamber and then evaporate the anthocyanin DDT, and it will form large, these like millimeter size um, crystals with a much higher purity. Um, it's been shown that with this technique, you can decrease the um, inhomogeneous broadening by about a factor of 100. Um, uh, so you're, you're talking about like you know tens to hundreds of gigahertz as opposed to like a, a, a nanometer um, of, of an inhomogeneous broadening. Um, and then the idea with this would be to like identify a bunch of um, molecules within the crystal and then apply a different uh, a differential gradients of electric field over all of them because we we kind of you know it, it seems that the the shifting rate of a molecule depends on the intensity of the light at the molecule. And so then the game would be, what kind of electric field gradient can you shine onto the entire crystal? And can you have differential electric field gradients that were the two things close enough together that you have um, you know, a, a collective system which is kind of spread out over, over a, a larger distance? Um, you know, probably not a millimeter, but microns. And then as kind of a, a last interesting Point of investigation. One, one interesting thing about this system as opposed to like the atomic system is that you also have the lattice to take into account. And so um, it's known that if you take one of these organic molecules and you excite the electronic level, uh, the, the excited orbital takes up more space than the ground state, uh, which exerts a pressure on the surrounding lattice. And if you have two very, very close molecules, um, they will feel that pressure. You know, when, when when one is excited, it bends the last and the other molecule to feel that. And so one thing to investigate is, you know, if you can have uh, a collective photon emission, like super radiance and sub radiance, by passing photons back and forth, could you have some kind of um, coherent phonon-phonon interactions? Could you have like phonon super radiance, phonon sub radiance? Could you modify the uh, interaction of the molecule with the environment that way? So uh, that is, yeah, that's something we'd like to introduce or investigate in the near future. So a phone on modes clear yes. history or continuous? Pardon me? So a phone on modes. Uh, okay, phone so spectrum of, uh, is continuum or is it it is, it is continuous in the lattice, um, but it's, I, I, I guess, uh, from the modeling I've seen, there's like a, like a continuous 
lattice phonon, but then there's also these, what they call quasi-local phonon modes, and that's like, you know, phonons like closer to the molecule. And so, um, I don't know, but I'm, not, I'm not sure how you'd model that, whether it be discretized or not. And again, it's right, it should probably be discretized if you want to have coherent interactions. It's like actually, it's convenient to just give you something coherent and so it plays in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know, the, it, it's kind of interesting from, because like, okay, so if you have like a, you know, I think perovskite, so it's like a different quantum emitter, you can have things which are like kind of delocalized and kind of localized. So that's, that's like, a, like an excitation which exists over a small region. And so um, I don't know if this is if you have some similar, like a phonon is like quasi local, where it's like hangs out near enough the imperfection that you could get some discretization. I don't actually, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. So how would you detect the phonon mode in this kind of system? Yeah. Uh, you probably wouldn't be looking for a single phonon mode. You'd probably be looking for uh, something more like, like you measure the entire, um, uh, what's called the Debye Waller factor, which is like you know the decay of the excited state to the phonon sideband, and measure that entire thing and see like can you modify that um, by making a collective system. So, okay. Um, with that, I will uh, like to thank. Um, my group. I'd like to thank uh, Emma for collecting all this data with me, and then our collaborators, uh, Levi Huang and Malachi Walker. So. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. So maybe for the for the last part where you talked about like going like using this close sublimation technique, is there maybe could you imagine that there's a way of like putting the molecules on the lattice, like maybe seeding them chemically or something? Uh, <laughs> you have a meta structure surface, and then you do this on top of that. Is that yes, I think that there are, there are also. I'm sorry, I'm trying to think. I, I know that there are some techniques to like nano print these crystals so that they're in, in a nice array, um, and so that that could be one way to do it. Um, I have thought about like like if you okay, so you know that like crystals preferentially grow on like defects. If you have like, a flat surface and you like chip it somewhere, crystals will grow there. And so that would be an interesting thing to investigate. Like if you um, etched a bunch of holes, like would nano crystals preferentially grow in the sites? Mm -hmm. So that is that would be an interesting thing. Yeah, nano crystals, but also just the molecules, right? Like from oh, yeah. the the if there's like preferential attachment or something. Yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting because uh, in all these techniques, like the crystal is grown at the same time as doping. If you're saying like grow the crystal first and then dope it afterwards, and then or or some seeds, right? Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. One interesting thing for me is that the we can make the doping high enough so that there's going to be a molecule wherever we want it. Right. So if we want to go for land over for spacing, we're going to have molecules there. That Challenge is how do we get molecules that are land over four apart from each other in the resin. But there, I think we don't have the same constraint that atoms do because we're not limited by the fraction limit. Because in principle, we can make a large gradient at land over four distance without having to use a Gaussian beam with the maximum one or the maximum. So we're kind of hoping we can use those type of super resolution bridging techniques to get to spacing much less than what we want. I saw a couple more questions. Yeah, I'm just curious. So you were showing that when you tune the molecules onto resonance, that you see the peak reduced. Um, okay. The copying reduced to zero here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the spacing kind of uh, becomes uh, comparable to the line width. So can you use that to estimate the typo typo copying strengths? Yeah. yeah. Purposely. Uh, I think if I understand your question right, I think you can correct me if this is, isn't the right understanding. But so like as you tune it closer together, the subarray peak extinguishes, and uh, that's this curve right here. should also stop somewhere. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. And so like at the point stops. So this is the detuning of the molecules when the subarray peak is completely gone, mm -hmm. and then that you can just read off the couple of strength from that detuning, from that, that that kind of a avoidance. Is that is that, that, was that a question you're asking? And so yeah, we, when we were so measuring, does, does, yeah. does the line width also narrow down? For the yes, but that, that's a lot harder to, uh, to 
to measure if it's not as, a, as a easy of a measurement as measuring the height. Because you know, as it's tuning together, there's some like jitter in the height, you know, maybe because it's going back and forth or something. Um, and there's also a little bit of like jitter in the line width. And so you know, if you plot the line width here and this curve, it's a lot easier to see just from, from the extinction of the height. It's a lot, yeah, a lot clearer measurement. Uh, how does the phonon frequency compare with the DBT resonant frequency, the transition? Um, so the phonon is like a, like the phonon sideband is really wide. Okay. Um, not sure how, how wide, probably like nanometers. Um, I guess, I guess, so the, we're, we're talking about like this kind of thing here. So this is, this is from a, a two photon peak measured by two couple molecules in 2002. Uh, and then the, this is the frequency of the double excited state in the center of them. And what he noticed is that the double excited state was off shifted from the center about 100 megahertz. And so that indicates is that like, as the, when the molecules are both excited, due to the, um, the bending of the lattice, the, uh, the uh, double excited state has slightly more energy. So um, I, you know, it would be an interesting question, I guess, if you could back out that Phonon, phonon interaction frequency um, from this type of measurement. I, I don't know if you can, but that's um, an interesting question. So you're, you have like a 3D geometry, right? A 3D lattice that these molecules, these emitters are embedded in. Yes. You know? Is there anything interesting of changing the dimensionality, putting them on a surface uh, of something? Yeah, so the, the, the goal right now, especially with the post elevation crystals, is to make them as two dimensional as possible. Um, so like the, the nanocrystal dimensions will be like, you know, let's say like 500 nanometers on side, 500 nanometers on side, and then like one to 200 nanometers tall. So they're kind of like platelets, and um, just because it's, you know, if you can make it very flat, you can be more confident, you know, about how spaced apart everything is. Um, but, you know, I mean, yeah, there's still enough leeway to get like interesting geometrical considerations. Like if you have like four couple of molecules, like I'm sure, the, the geometry of those spaces has a huge effect on, on like the, the spectrum and all that. <laughs>